Good. That wasn't very enthusiastic. How are we? Hey, there we are. Hey, it's awesome to have you here with us uh, this evening. We've got an awesome service ahead of us. Uh, Pastor Jake will be bringing us the word, which uh, I'm excited to hear. We've got praise and worship. What more could you want? Hey, uh, just as people keep trickling in, make sure that you fill from the front. Don't be shy. No one around here is going to bite you. So come down the front, get get in nice and close to one another. Um, And how about we catch up with our neighbors, see how everyone's week's been, and then uh, we'll get into some worship shortly after that. Church, we're ready to worship God together. It's time to bring this go. We're going to praise and worship His name. You all excited to be in church this evening? Yes? Yay. Good. There's a blessings over Praise the Lord. Praise. 
I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, and He'll never let me down. And I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground. My hope and firm foundation, He'll never let me down. No, oh, and I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground. My hope and firm foundation, He'll never let me down. Oh, I put my faith. My anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, He'll never let me down, He'll never let me down. Yes, Father, great is your faithfulness. Lord, from the rising sun to the setting same, we will praise, we will praise, we will praise your name, Lord. We will lift your name up above the mountaintops, Father, because you are so good. You are so worthy of praise, Lord. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that no matter how far we walk, no matter how dark the valley gets, Lord, you will not forsake us. You will not leave us, Lord, but you will lift us up in your righteous hand, Lord. Even though we didn't deserve it, Father, you have called us to be more than enough. You have called us to be righteous too, just like you. And Father, today we just want to praise your name above everything else in the room, above everything else in our city, in our lives, Lord. 
and our jobs and our study. Father, everything else going on right now just gets put aside. And we just want to lift up the name of Jesus and say, you are king. You are our God. You are the father of all creation. In your name, there is breakthrough, Lord. In your name, there is miracles. Lord, we love you. We honor you. And we just want to give you the, all the praise, all the glory, Lord. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Awesome. You guys can take a seat. It's early, but that worship's going to get me started. How good. Oh, well, welcome if uh, you didn't catch me at the beginning. It's good to have you all here with us this evening. I like that it's a little bit more packed now. It's kind of in that last, that kind of 701 to 703 vibe. We sort of get a few more people. It's good. Uh, It's good to see a few familiar faces as well. How are you all doing? Good? Good. Stephen? I always like Stephen. He always talks back to me. He's a good guy. Hey, uh, it's awesome to have you here with us this evening. And uh, a special warm welcome to you if you're new with us. Um, Excuse me. If you are new with us um, and you're kind of, you've been around this, this, uh, this church for a couple of weeks or perhaps this is even your first time here and you're just sort of wondering, you know, what is Crossroads all about, um, then f- I, I encourage you to jump on our website and uh, check out the I'm New section. On there, it's got all the information that you'll need to know about us. It's also got some, uh, some vital contact details that you can get in contact with. Um, but if you can't really be bothered doing that, then we've got these little packs out in the info desk. Just grab one on your way out. Um, if you're feeling a little bit shy, just, just quickly, you know, sneak it on your way through and head on out the doors. But otherwise, if you are feeling brave, uh, we always have some of the church leadership down here at the front, and we are more than wanting to talk to you. Uh, we, we, wanna, we just hope that this can be a place that you could call home, and uh, if we can play a little, bit, little part in that, then that would be awesome too. If, uh, if the leaders are too scary, I know they can be sometimes. Look at the person on your left, look at the person on your right. They want to get to know you as well. So uh, just don't leave here without talking to someone or at least grabbing one of those little packs. Trust me, it's, uh, it's worthwhile. Um, but it is, uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And as I said, we've got an awesome uh, service ahead of us. Pastor Jake will be bringing us the word this evening, which I'm excited to hear. Um, we've kind of had this uh, little two-week um, two-week multi-series we've kind of been doing here at church over the last couple of weeks. Um, At the morning service, we've had a different message as we have in the night service. Uh, I want to encourage you guys, if you are keen to find out more about that little multi-series that we did, go and listen to the uh, sermons that we have on YouTube, Spotify. Uh, It's pretty much everywhere. The one this morning that um, Daryl Purdy led us through was amazing. Uh, So I really encourage you to go and check that out. It's kind of got some uh, practical elements for us about our habits and, and the way that we live, um, and it's honestly, it's really good. I'd encourage you to go and have a listen to that, um, but also next week, we'll be starting, it is next week, we're starting our next series. Yes, that is correct, um, and we've got these little discussion guides. Um, if you on the way out, um, they're kind of on the wall on your right. If you just grab one of those, and uh, that'll kind of set you up for this next series that we're doing. Um, these discussion guides are filled with the scripture that we'll be looking at and also some questions for uh, you to look at yourself. Um, they're, they're perfect for your connect group. So if you're wondering what to do in connect group, grab one of these and go through it um, as we have the message on the Sunday. Then you kind of go over it again in your connect groups. And it's just an awesome way to really kind of develop what you've learned in a message and apply it into your uh, daily lives as well, as well as also hear other people's uh, perspectives and opinions, opinions are good too, and uh, and uh, yeah, and it works really well. We do it a bit in in our in our connect group uh, time to time, and yeah, it's it's really precious uh, precious time for us. On that note, though, if you aren't in a connect group, you need to get in one. Trust me, that church is good, church is great, church is the best, but. There's, there's also discipleship that happens in the weekdays as well, right? It's not just a Sunday. It's not just this little petrol station that you come to on a Sunday to get filled up and then hopefully last the week till next Sunday. Uh, we've also got connect groups that happen all throughout the week. If you're not in one, we've got a board uh, in the foyer that's filled with all the lovely faces of people who run them. Um, you can get in contact with any of them. You can also um, grab Pastor Isaac, who's up there on stage. He would love to have a talk to you about what connect group you can fit into. There is a connect group for you. I promise you that. And they are so worthwhile to get involved with. Um, raise a hand if you agree with me. They are worthwhile getting involved. There you go. Come on. Point proven. 
Um, anyway, we've got a lot of stuff coming up here at Crossroads, but one of the cool things that we're excited to be a part of and the things that are coming up is this thing called the Send. Uh, so we're going to turn our eyes to the screen now and have a little look, and then Mike is going to jump up and uh, talk us through it a little bit more. There is a war for our attention. Do you feel it? We tolerate a life of ease and entertainment in order to numb ourselves to the brokenness, fear, and hopelessness in this world. For so long, we, the carriers of hope, have been silent, afraid to step out. We wrestle with the question, what difference can I possibly make? I'm only one person. The harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. But in each of us, there is a deep cry, a yearning for a life of purpose, adventure, and freedom. And it is Jesus who is the answer to that longing. A generation is searching for truth and heaven awaits your response. You were made to be a carrier of hope and a light in the darkness. Every response matters. Every yes adds to the anthem echoing around the world, proclaiming Jesus is alive. It's time to stand up and take action. It's time to say, here I am, Lord, send me. It's time to go. Come on. Is anyone here excited about the send? Yeah. Oh, that was so much better than the morning service. But, uh, so my name's Micah, and I have the privilege of kind of being a full-time missionary here in New Zealand, meaning that for the last few years, I've got to travel all around the nation, probably about six times between Kaitaia and Bluff. And guys, let me tell you, God is on the move. It's still early days, but people are more open to hearing the good news of Jesus. God is moving in power and transforming people's lives like I've never seen before, and it is time for us to take action. And that's what the send exists to serve. The send exists to serve what God is already doing in the nation. Because guys, I can't do it all by myself. Pastor Reuben, as amazing as he is, he can't do it all by himself. It's gonna take every single one of us if we wanna see our nation transformed and saved by the love of Jesus. And that's what the send exists to serve. So. We're really excited. We've got a guy called Francis Chan and another guy called Andy Bird who are coming here to serve us uh, in May, on May 13th at TSB Arena in Wellington. Uh, if you're keen for this, uh, jump on the Crossroads website, register there. They'll be organizing some transport down. But I'm really excited to say that if you can't make it to Wellington, we're actually going to be doing a Send Manawatu event hosted here at Crossroads on Saturday the 10th of August. And these events are all building to Mystery Creek, the 23rd of November, where we've got Francis Chan, Andy Bird, Jeremy Riddle, Banning Liebscher, and a whole bunch of awesome quality Kiwi speakers who are going to be gathering alongside many others throughout the nation to go after Jesus and a fresh wave of the gospel through our nation. Guys, it's time. It's time that New Zealand heard the gospel again, and we... You all have a really important part to play in it. So, is that us? Should we do it? Yeah. yeah, come on. So, if you're interested, scan the QR codes, jump on the website, and we'll see you there. Thanks for having me. Awesome. How good. Thank you, Micah. Yeah, it's pretty exciting and it's something to look forward to. Uh, Francis Chan's always been a, a highlight for me in, in terms of his messages. He's so good with the way that he applies things. So, yeah, I'm excited for it as well. Make sure that you get the dates down. That's the one in Hamilton. The other one was the 13th of May. So make sure you chuck it in your calendars and jump on, like uh, Micah said, jump on the Crossroads website or on our app and just register if you don't have uh, a car or a means to get down there, that's okay. We'll sort you out. Um, I believe the, the church van will probably be going as well, so you, you'll be sorted. Um, but as I said, uh, there's a lot of things coming up here at Crossroads, so now we're going to turn our eyes to the screen again and have a look at it. Hey everyone, here's what's coming up in the life of our church. 
This Saturday, the young adults are heading for a hike together. Uh, this is always one of our favourite events each year where we get to just enjoy each other's company all while hanging out uh, in God's beautiful creation. And if you're in the 18 to 30 bracket, we'd so love for you to be one of those people that we get to hang out with. So here's what you'll need to know. We're heading to Rangawahia Hut, which is just under an hour and a half from here. So what we'll do is meet here at church at 8.30 and then head off in one big convoy which means that you need to sort yourself out a ride. But don't worry, if you're just getting connected in and you're not sure of someone to drive you out, we'll be taking the church van too and there'll be plenty of space for you. All you need to do is let us know that you're after a ride when you register. Once we arrive, it's about our two hour walk to the top where we'll have lunch together. Uh, the track does have some good uphill in there, but don't be put off, it's definitely a doable walk for most people. Uh, and then once we've had lunch and soaked in the views, we'll head back down and drive back into Palmy. It's always a little hard to estimate times on these events, so we do suggest that you just block out the day for it. But of course, the most important thing you need to do is get yourself registered, because we'll send you all the details from there. So head along to the website or jump onto the church app and sign yourself up. Yeah, get onto that. And another event we're really excited about is The Scent. Uh, this is going to be a powerful night of worship and teaching at the TSB Arena in Wellington. They will have Francis Chan and Andy Bird speaking, and you won't want to miss it. Tickets have recently been reduced to just $2 each, and we'd love as many people to head along as possible. It's on May 13th, which will come up really quick. So again, get onto the website and register, and from there, we'll send you a link to go and purchase your ticket also. And finally, it was so cool to be able to host our CY Easter camp out at the Lauritsons place over Easter weekend. And the kids had an absolute blast. We know there were many of you who helped support this weekend and kids getting to camp and we wanted to let you in on some of the fun that they got up to. So take a look at the highlights clip. As you can see, we had an incredible time at our Easter camp, and so many of you made it possible. So I want to extend a massive thank you to everyone who contributed. Whether you made a financial contribution, donated food, or prayed for us while we were away, we are so grateful for all the people that helped make camp happen. A special thanks to John and Kath for hosting us, and also to their connect group who served food, ran games, and hung out with us for the weekend. We truly appreciate it. We had heaps of fun and have all been encouraged by the stories and the testimonies from the students, which makes it all worth it. So thanks heaps again. Awesome, and that's it for Church News this week. Don't forget to register for those upcoming events. Bye for now. Enjoy the rest of the service. How good. How fast were those kids moving in that video? They must have been so tired after camp. It's a good dad joke, wasn't it? All right. We're going to continue worshiping God before Jake brings the word tonight. So why don't you stand with us as we worship? Oh, 
accomplished to save the Lord's grace and mercy displayed upon the cross our redemption he's a hope for all mankind one name over everything one name over everything Jesus over
Father, we thank you that you are worthy of our prayers. You're on a mighty God. And Jesus, we glorify and worship and lift up the name above every name. Lord, we just want to say that we love you. And you're so worthy of our worship. We give you all praise, all glory, all honor. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. What a cool time of worship. How are we, church? We're good? Awesome. So good to be here. Hey, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Jake. I'm the Young Adults Pastor uh, here, so I hang out uh, here a fair bit and uh, get to hang out with you guys. And um, it is a real joy and a real privilege um, and a real privilege to get to bring uh, the Word of God this evening uh, to us. Um, we are sort of in a, uh, yeah, as Sam said, just kind of a, a funny two weeks where we're doing something different at morning and night, um, so that's been really cool. And tonight, uh, I'm going to speak under the, the heading of the idol of my image, the idol of my image. And, uh, you know, we live in an image-centered, brand-saturated world, a world obsessed with the, the way we look. And... Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're, you're saying, Jake, I've, I've come to church in my, my knockoff Burks and my Kmart board shirt, uh, shorts and oversized T-shirts, still got a bit of mince pie in it from dinner. Maybe uh, that's not really an issue for me. Um, maybe image isn't, a, isn't something I struggle with, and maybe that's true. Um, but what I want to speak on tonight uh, is not a superficial message to say that uh, you need to stop caring about what you wear. Uh, it's not a message to say that we need to stop caring about how many likes are rolling through our Instagram feed. Again, maybe you do. That's probably not that great. But um, no doubt you've heard that message a hundred times. Um, but it's, it's not really what I want to talk about tonight. I, I want to kind of get down to the root of the problem. Uh, I want to dig a little deeper tonight. And uh, I, I want to talk about a tendency that I think us as Jesus followers can fall into so easily. Uh, and that is this tendency to begin... Uh, living a certain way so that we might look like we fit into a culture that we were never supposed to fit into anyway, right? So many of us, I believe, are, are desperate to fit into a culture, uh, fit into a friend group, fit into a way of thinking, fit into a relationship. We're, we're, we're desperate to fit into things that we weren't ever supposed to fit into, and you know, the saddest thing uh, about that for, for us who know Jesus is we have this, you know, incredible gift of freedom and salvation. We already have that, one that gives us everlasting life and abundance of blessing. But I think yet due to the, the sinful natures of our heart sometimes, we're still trying to fit into the very things that will take us further away from the Savior that secures us our salvation. Uh, and tonight... I, I want to get stuck into quite a well-known piece of scripture from the Old Testament book of Daniel, uh, and I want to unpack this a little bit further together. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be heading, uh, heading to Daniel chapter 3, so you can head there uh, now. But before we, we get stuck into it, um, just some context about what we're going to be reading. Uh, this is a time where, where the Jewish people, God's people, the people of Israel, they'd been taken captive by the Babylonian Empire, uh, in, and they'd gone into exile, into captivity. Uh, and this is an exile that would go on to last for about 70 years. And, and during this time, uh, the people of Israel, they were made to live within Babylon and under Babylonian rule. So things weren't really that great uh, for, for the nation of Israel at, at this time. Um, but in saying this, there were some, some relative freedoms that they were granted during their stay in Babylon. So, for instance, they were able to, to marry and they were able to have kids. They, they could buy and sell houses. They could carry out their, their business there. Uh, and at the time of this exile, right, uh, ba Babylon was, was ruled by this king called Nebuchadnezzar. You've probably heard that name before if you grew up in church. Um, and where we're about to start reading from, Nebuchadnezzar uh, had just built this massive golden statue. Uh, Bible, the Bible says it was 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, uh, which equates to about 27 meters tall. And uh, I, I've done some research for us uh, to put that into context. You know the Palmy Clock Tower in the middle of the square? 
that's about 30 meters high. So, um, so that's about how big this statue was. It was a big gold statue. And, and he's, he's gone and he's put out this decree or a command that said that any time that music is played, uh, that everybody in the land must fall down and worship this statue. And he was really serious about this uh, because he, he also put a punishment in place for, for anybody who refused to do this. Uh, and essentially the punishment was death. Uh, because the punishment was uh, for anybody who disobeyed this decree was to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And uh, of course, for, for the Israelite people who were living in Babylon in captivity at the time, this created a conflict for them. Uh, because they worship the one true God, the God of Israel. And so bowing down to this statue uh, would be an issue for them. It, it, it would create a conflict. Uh, but in, in the story that we're going to read tonight, uh, there were three brave young Israelite men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who refused to bow down to this statue. They deemed their faith in God way too important to do so. And uh, we were about to start reading. The king has just found out about these three men who have been defying his ruling. Uh, and we're going to start at verse 13. Uh, so let's pick it up now. Here's what it says. It says, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, uh, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to say those words a lot tonight. And throw them into the blazing furnace. So so these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire even killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar, he he leaps to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty, And he said, well, look, I saw four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. And Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, uh, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. And Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defiled, uh, so defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve uh, any or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I, I decree that the people of any nation or any language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. All right, 
that's a big piece of scripture. Thanks for hanging in there. There's a lot of lists in there, right? I, I kind of noticed that. I feel like some parts of the Bible, like there's just very little detail and you're like you're left wanting more. But th- this one, they, they just list everything. They've, they've, they've got it there for us. Um, it's a Sunday school classic, right? Uh, the, the story of the furnace. Uh, it's one of those incredible stories from the Bible that, that we hear talked about so often in, in songs and in sermons, and it, it's really this incredible story and testament to God's faithfulness. Um, but whether you've heard it uh, before or, or that's your first time hearing it tonight, um, I believe that there's some solid truth that we can all take out of this historical account. When it comes to the idol of our image, And uh, we're just going to crack right into it tonight. The first truth I want us to take from this today is this. We are not called to conform. We're called to follow. Hear that. We are not called to conform. We are called to follow. You know, conformity uh, is what the, the, the king was asking of the Jewish people. Essentially, what he had done with his decree, where he'd asked everyone to worship this gold image, is he's, he's told the people that he's taken out of Judah, hey, listen, you can live in my land, and, and you can live here with some relative freedoms. You can buy yourself a house, get yourself a job, make yourself at home. And, and, and just by the way, this is also what God had told them to do. God, through the prophet of Jeremiah, had said to his, his people, he said, hey, you're going to be here for a while, so, so uh, go ahead and settle in. Uh, seek to make peace and work hard in this city. Um, but this decree, what, what the king had done was start to put some conditions on their freedom within Babylon. He said, you can, you can live here and the city will, will look after you just so long as you bow down and worship our gods. And in this case, uh, this gold statue that he set up. And he was asking for them to conform in return for their acceptance into his city. He was putting some conditions on this freedom. And I want you to know tonight, church, that as Christ followers, we too are exiles in our city. And, uh, you know, we live in, in, in... relative freedom here in New Zealand. Uh, We live in a fairly global world now. The New Zealand passport is one of the more powerful in the world. It can get us into lots of places, lots of countries. Uh, So I can understand if that doesn't really make sense to you. Uh, But scripture tells us that as Christ followers, we too are exiles. That when we become uh, a part of the kingdom of heaven that Christ invites us into, our spiritual home is no longer here on this earth, but our true home is with Christ in the full presence of God in heaven. And the incredible part is that we will get to go home and, and live with Christ there one day, and I cannot wait for that day. But right now we are here on this earth, and so we are called to set up homes, build houses, live in peace with those around us, and be good workers in the land. And while we have, uh, you know, relatively good freedom here in New Zealand, and we're so blessed in New Zealand that this is the case, don't be mistaken, I do believe that the culture that we live in has also begun to place some conditions on our acceptance. I don't know if you've, you've noticed this too. I find it extraordinary, for example, that, that one of the popular slogans or catchphrases now is this idea of, you know, you do you. You heard that? You do you. And uh, there's, there's a lot of problems really with that saying, but um, it's, it's saying kind of you be the most authentic self that you can be. And that doesn't really sound like that bad of an idea, does it? That sounds like a good idea. But it's an idea, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but in society it comes with some conditions. Because what I've come to realize, it's really a, a more of a you do you uh, so long as it falls within these parameters. So, so long as it looks a certain way, if you talk a certain way, believe certain things, value certain things. And it's become this sort of conditional freedom, this conditional love and acceptance. And I reckon it's this crooked conditional love and acceptance that, that society is offering that I believe has, you know, cosmetic clinics packed to the brim with young people feeling the need to change their physical appearance in order to be their authentic self. You know, do you see the sadness in that? I, I believe it's the same reason that, that cancel culture has become what it has become today, uh, because we now require everyone to fit within a socially acceptable box. We've removed the opportunity for robust debate, different opinions. 
because society's really been saying, you do you, so long as that looks like this, so long as that, that doesn't challenge my worldview. And the Israelites in the story today, they were, they were in a tough spot. They were going to be in Babylon for a while. They'd been told to respect the authorities there, to settle in for a while. But unfortunately, the king had begun to place some conditions on this freedom. And I want us to be aware, church, that the Christian faith, our Christian faith is countercultural. When we live for Christ and we take his teaching seriously, you know, the Christian walk will have us living differently to how culture would suggest that we do. It will see us being unusually generous with our resources. It will see us looking out for the outcasts that culture have pushed out. It will see us caring for the controversial. It will see us standing out from the crowd in some uncomfortable ways. And please know that, that while Jesus was perfectly loving, while he was the greatest gift from God, he was also quite a controversial figure. His teachings were a little bit polarizing. They graded with some of the ways that, that, uh, the culture of the culture of the day, and they still do. And therefore, as Christians who hold fast to his truth, don't be surprised when you notice some, of, some conditions uh, of acceptance in this culture make your walk as a Jesus follower a little bit uncomfortable. And I wonder if you've noticed some of these sort of this conditional acceptance in areas of your own life. Are there areas in your life that society would ask you to conform? Maybe you've noticed it uh, in, in the workplace, that there are new policies that don't sit quite right with you, uh, or your job is requiring you to behave in a way or treat people in a way that just doesn't really seem Christ-like. Maybe it's within your social circles, and just because of your differing values, uh, you're finding it increasingly hard to maintain certain relationships, certain friendships, because it would sort of mean eroding certain standards you have just to kind of fit in with the group or, or be around those people. Maybe you've noticed the pressure uh, to conform through trying to keep up with the Joneses, you know, that, uh, and you've found yourself kind of sky high in debt, just, just trying to conform with what culture would tell you you should have by this, this age, by this stage of your life. If we are living a, a bold Christian life, we will begin to notice more and more areas in our life that grate with the world around us, uh, where the world would ask us to fall into line and to conform. But I come back to my point, we are not called to conform, but to follow. Yes, we're to live in peace. Yes, work hard for these people. But that does not mean that we bow down to their idols. It doesn't mean we worship their gods. We don't just accept the, the conditions and the caveats that they place on our freedom because we follow the one true God. And our God is one that defends his people and loves his people and cares for his people and has given his people true freedom. And so we do not need to bow down to culture's counterfeit idols of materialism and status and influence to receive our freedom because we already have it. Amen? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are great examples of people who knew what they had in God and who placed their love for God above everything else, who were unaffected by what the majority were doing or what the popular opinion at the time was. They understood that their call was not to conform, not to live in fear of the culture, but to follow their God and what he asked of them. And I believe we've got to get some of that same grit in our own decision making. Because every day, this world will ask us to conform to something we're not supposed to be a part of. And every day, we will have to make tough decisions to stand firm in what you know to be true. Not being distracted, not being swayed by others around us. And that could be uncomfortable. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were at a point in life where serving God, the God they loved, was going to look pretty darn uncomfortable thrown in a fiery furnace, kind of uncomfortable. And, and maybe you've heard about the peace of God, you've heard about the joy of God, the redemption of God, and hearing that serving God can be uncomfortable or even risky, well, that doesn't really fit in with the messaging you've heard to this point. 
And I want you to know that from my experience, I, I think I could speak for many in this people, uh, people in this room, I've found that serving God has brought abundant joy into my life. Uh, serving God has saved me from incredible amounts of pain as I've chosen to live in His ways. It's given me a deep-seated peace and hope and joy. It's been the best decision I've ever made. But yeah, serving God has also been uncomfortable, and it is uncomfortable at times. Sometimes has us sticking out from the crowd. It has us doing things with our time and our money that doesn't have us on the fast track to wealth. Uh, It doesn't always put us in the most glamorous places or in the easiest situations. And Shadrach and his mates, they could attest to this. But their faith was able to withstand the pressures of conformity even in the wildest of circumstances. And I think it was clear that that was because they had known a faithfulness of God in their lives before. It was clear that they didn't simply have a Sunday morning or Sunday night faith. They had a faith built on substance, built through past experience with a God who had provided for them and protected them. It was clear that they had hidden the scriptures of Moses within their heart. Uh, They'd learned the words written to them in Deuteronomy that say, you know, the Lord your God will go before you and will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt. So an empty statue and the pressure to conform would not have no power over them and the trust that they had in their God. And not only do we every day get to cling to those same promises spoken by Moses, but we can also look to the words of Jesus Christ, who spelled it out very clearly to us, that in this world we will have trouble, but we can take heart because he has overcome the world. And we can know that even if serving God looks uncomfortable at times, we can already stand in the knowledge of a victory over death that means that our present suffering and our present hurt will not last, cannot defeat us, because we serve an undefeated God who has already defeated death once and for all. We're not called to conform, but to follow. But you know, I think it's easy to read the story of the furnace and read it through the lens of the Sunday school story that many of us will know it to be. And in doing so, we can, we can view the kind of options that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had as completely black and white or completely linear. Like that they could either serve God and get thrown in, uh, sorry, yeah, serve God and get thrown in the furnace, or they could worship the idol that had been set up and, and give up their faith completely. But I want to talk about another reality that I think we can be tempted to take sometimes when we often find ourselves in. And it's this, it's the living in the in-between. And this is the second takeaway I have for us tonight. I want to talk about the danger of living in the in-between. You know, I can only imagine some of the things that must have been going through the minds of these three young men uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar put out this decree. Because without the miraculous intervention of their God in that furnace, the decision of the head of them was essentially life or death for them. It was a big deal. This would not have been a decision that they would have made lightly. And uh, listen, you know, this is by no means written in the holy book, but my human mind, it just, it wonders about the thoughts that must have been going through their minds at this point in the time. And I wonder if they were tempted to create a compromise, if they were tempted to try and live in the in-between. I wonder if they were thinking things like, well, hey, God knows our heart. He knows that we love him. He knows that our faith is in him, but we'll be good, no good to him around here if, if, if we're dead. So, hey, what if we bowed down in public? What, what if we just went through the routines like everyone else? We bow when we're supposed to. We keep up appearances, but God will know our heart. He'll know that, that we're not in, engaging in genuine worship. And, and given the circumstances, surely he'll understand, right? I wonder if they were tempted to think thoughts like that. And maybe because you know how the story ends, that sounds almost a little bit weak to you. But I think this has probably been many of our experience, and I wonder if you can share in this also. The the, the enemy is so cunning in the way that he acts, and it's so often, I think, in in these times of hardship and these these hard decisions, that the enemy comes and he kind of offers a compromise, an in-between. 
the in-between of where, where God would have us go and the comforts of this world. In-betweens that might kind of sound like, you know, things like, I, I won't get blackout drunk, but I, I'll just have enough to, to, to take the edge off. You know, it's been a hard few days, a hard few weeks. It might just help numb the feeling of pain a little bit, get me back on my feet. That sort of compromise. Or maybe it sounds like, I, I, I'm not going to sleep with my girlfriend. I, I wouldn't want to step over the boundaries that she's put in place. But maybe if I just watch a few videos online, that'll help me maintain some self-control and it won't hurt anyone else. And, and maybe that's a good solution. That sort of compromise. Or, or I won't go as far as to use God's name in vain, but some loose language or, or crass jokes would be okay because it, it'll help me fit in with the workplace culture that I'm around. And you know what? I'll probably make a better impact for the gospel that way anyways because people won't think I'm weird. That sort of compromise. Or maybe it's like I, I'm going to hold on to this grudge or, or harbor this unforgiveness in my heart. But it won't be forever. It's just a part of my healing process. And one day I'll deal with it. Every day we're offered compromises. And there are so many lies that the enemy can whisper into our lives. So many justifications that he would want us to believe that will somehow let us live in the best of both worlds. And the perfect in between. But make no mistake, though the enemy will come and he will present himself in the form of a smart solution, though he might offer you safety or some sort of temporary relief, the enemy is only ever out to kill and destroy. And he knows if he could just get you to make a small compromise. If he could just make you, have have you make a small decision like opening a web page or twisting off a bottle cap, that, that, that'll have you right where he needs you to lead you into dependency, into to addiction, into brokenness, whatever else might follow. And he's so predictable. It's his oldest trick in the book. He'll come and he'll offer you the world, all while, offer, uh, all while robbing you of the greatest joy and counsel and protection you'll ever need or want, which is found in your heavenly Father, who promises to go before you and walk behind you, who promises that he won't bring you against temptation too great for you and his spirit to take on together. But the enemy, he will, he will try and distract us with his lies and his, his bold claims. It's a lie he told Eve in the Garden of Eden. He offered her wisdom and knowledge and greater authority, all while taking her away from the very presence of the all-knowing and the all-powerful God. It's even a lie he tried on with Jesus in the wilderness, where he offered Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world. Where he, uh, all of the kingdoms of the world. He said, all of this I will give to you if you worship me. And he's speaking to the Son of God. Don't fall for the lie. Don't fall for the promises of security and acceptance from the empty things of this world. Don't fall for the the danger of compromise, for for the promise of temporary relief, but hold fast to the truth of God's word. word. Don't dilute his provision. He's in it with you. Take his hand. Let him weather the storm with you. Hold a little tighter when the, the temperature gets turned up. Be bold enough to to stick out from the crowd and live a non-conforming, uncompromised kind of faith. There's this great bit of scripture in Joshua. You've probably seen part of it cross-stitched somewhere on your great aunt's wall. Um, It says this, If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day who you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the god of the Amorites in whose land you are living. He goes on to say, this is the popular part, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was saying to his people, are you in or out? I need you to make a choice, but living in the in-between won't really cut it. And I'm sorry if, if that's too blunt, you can take that up with Joshua, but I present this to us in a loving way as someone who is heavily reliant on the grace of God in my life as I constantly fall short of the mark. But I tell us this tonight knowing full well the danger of a compromise when I try to incorporate the things of the world into my faith. And I've experienced it. I know that it doesn't make things easier, but rather it sets us up with bad habits, toxic behaviors, unhelpful baggage. Let's not fall for the lies of compromise, but stand firm with the God who will bring us through.
as the band comes up, there's uh, one last truth I want to take from this piece of scripture tonight. And I think it might even be the most important one. And it's this. This is so much bigger than just yourself. This is so much bigger than just yourself. You know, the title of this message uh, is The Idol of My Image. And it's titled that because sometimes I think the idol in our lives isn't the gold statue or the sin itself, but it's our motive for bowing down to those things. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, should they have bowed down to that statue, they wouldn't have been doing so out of a love for that statue. They were far brighter than that. Should they have bowed down to that statue, they would have been doing so out of an idolization of their image, the idol of conformity and fitting in with the crowd, what everybody else was doing. And I believe that we can become so me-centric, so self-focused that when temptations come, we tend to only think of the ramifications that this will have on our own lives, the level of discomfort that we will experience, the humiliation that we might have to go through if we step out in faith or do something countercultural. But I think perhaps the most incredible part of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that furnace was not only that God brought them out of the furnace completely unscathed. And don't get me wrong, that was incredible. That's a testament to God's faithfulness that we'll talk about for all of time. But what might be even more incredible is how God used the trust and the faithfulness of those three young guys to impact an entire city. I don't know if you remember what happens after verse 28, uh, when, when the king had pulled the three boys out of the fire, there wasn't a burn on their body. The scripture it went on to say, it said, Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree, the king said, that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Do you catch the significance in that? The Israelites who were living under Babylonian rule, they had been taken away from their home country. They were now being forced to serve other gods, but because of the unashamed, non-conformed, uncompromising faith of three young men, Israel was now free to worship their God boldly within Babylon. And the very king that had taken them into captivity was now praising the name of the God of Israel, the God of his enemies. And I've seen God do this time and time again. He's done it in my life. This church is full of testimonies where God has done this, where he takes what the enemy had intended to use for evil and he turns it for the good of his people and for the increase of his kingdom. And he does it through faithful servants, people like you and me who step out in boldness and are willing to face the heat of the fire, who understand that the impact of our faith is so much bigger than just ourselves. We can be so self-focused, so image-focused that we lose sight of just how powerful our witness can be when we take steps of faith and steps of obedience for God. But your attitude and your perseverance within the blazing fire can be the very thing that God uses to affect hundreds of people around you. And maybe it isn't hundreds. Maybe it's just the one friend, the one friend that's been struggling with depression and they say that, see the peace and the joy that you maintained in your hardest moments and they catch a glimpse of hope. They begin to ask questions about the God that brought you through it. Maybe it's the colleague whose wife was unfaithful to him, but he witnessed your perseverance in your hardship and he seeks you out for counsel and you're able to begin to tell him about the God who stood in the fire with you. Don't underestimate the power of your witness, what God could do through your simple day-to-day obedience. And so every day we will be faced with choices, right? Every day, you know, when a loved one close to you passes away, and you're in the fire of pain and confusion, we're faced with choices. When someone's unfaithful to us, stabs us in the back, we'll be faced with choices. When popular opinion uh, turns against us, when people disagree with us, want to cancel us, we'll face choices. When the demeaning jokes about your faith at work begin to heat up, you'll face choices. When you turn down that drink and get laughed in the face at, you'll face choices. 
Will you choose to fit in, to conform? Will you choose to compromise, to dilute the power of God in your circumstances, fall for the empty lies of the enemy? Or will you choose to adopt a Holy Spirit-fueled grit and call on the full power of an almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful God that cares and can bring you through any circumstance, any hurt, any fire, any storm? And then take your boldness and your obedience and use it to change countless lives around you. Your trust, your witness, your faithfulness to God in the fire might be the very thing that breaks generational cycles in your family. It might be the catalyst for a movement of revival within your friend group. It might be the light that has shone into the darkness of a friend's battle with depression. The cost of serving God may be great. It is great but the reward is eternal and your obedience can serve as the fertile ground that God will use to affect life change and to build His church upon. So are you willing? Are you willing to stick out from the crowd? Are you willing to be the guy or the girl that gets a little over the top and undignified during the worship songs? Are you willing to be the person that challenges your friends to stop toxic conversations about others? Are you ready to, be, ready to be the person in your friend group that is the first to really put God at the center of all that they do? That's the challenge that I have for us tonight. That's what I have for us. Let's not conform. Let's not compromise. But let's hold fast to His promises and be a witness to those around us of an unfailing, all-powerful God. As I wrap up, there's three groups of people that I want to speak to. The first of, you, uh, the first of those is uh, those of you who have been in the fire. These, uh, these past few years, months have been unchar- uh, uncharacteristically hard for you. The heat's been turned up a little. You've been struggling to see hope. Friend, I, I want you to know that you are so incredibly loved. I want you to know that despite the circumstances that led you into this season, be that persecution or something completely different, that there is a God who is more than willing to stand alongside you in the fire, a God who is not lacking in miracle power and with your faith in Him will bring you through this season. And not just that, but He's a God who can turn this season of your life for His good and for your good. Good things will come from this. I want you to know that. Don't tap out when the heat gets turned up. Is good on the way. The second group I want to speak to is those that are the tired of, of, of falling for the lies and the promises of comfort and security uh, that this world offers. You've realized that they're empty lies, that you're ready to explore what an uncompromised faith in Jesus Christ could look like. If that's you, I believe that beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ is the best decision you could ever make. And we're about to have a time of worship and we would love to pray with you, tell you more about the unconditional freedom found in Christ. Finally, the, the, the third group I want to speak to. Um, maybe you've, you've grown up in church or you've been down this journey a little while anyways. Um, but whether you've never really known the sustaining power of God in your life or the fire has just been shining a little bit dimmer recently, you've, you've been making some deals with the enemy. You've been fooling for the lies of compromise in your decision making. And here's what I want you to hear. I want you to hear that you're not too dirty. You're not too far gone. God hasn't left you alone in the fire. There is so much good that can come from your life too. There are some things that will need to be changed. There are some habits that will need to be reformed. Some relationships will begin, need to begin to heal. And some of those things can change overnight and others, it will take a process. But there's one thing for certain is that he promises you don't have to do it alone. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. And so wait on him, call on him, listen for his voice, ask for his strength, share strength from those around you. Get the right people around you, be willing to be held accountable. If that's you again, we would love to pray for you as well. And then just finally, sorry, I don't want to ramble on, but just finally as I was um, reading over this this afternoon, I just had it heavy on my heart that there might be young adults here tonight uh, who, who feel that it's 
it's time that they take their faith a little bit more seriously. You're ready, you think, to, to, to step up, take the next step in your faith. But there's the social pressure there, right? There's a social pressure there, and, and not just outside the church, not just in your workplaces and in secular environments, but even within the church. And things like, you know, raising your hands in worship and taking notes from, from the sermon, coming forward for prayer, that kind of things you would love to do, but your mates don't really do that. And can I tell you that that pressure, that, that feeling of that pressure, that first of all doesn't make you pathetic, it, it, it makes you human. But can I also tell you that your faith in Jesus Christ is far more important than what the people next to you think. And much like in our scripture today, God can use your boldness to be a witness to the very people in your row. Something as small as raising your hands uh, out of your love for Jesus could be the catalyst for the people in your row to step up in their faith, live more unashamed and live more uncompromised. So be bold. Be bold, step out. Be uncompromised. We're going to worship now. Um, so why don't you stand and I just want to pray for us as a church. God, we're just blown away by your kindness to us. Uh, as we read the story of the furnace tonight, we're just reminded of your faithfulness in every season. Can't imagine really in the context of New Zealand what it would look like to, to have to put our lives on the line for our faith. But we, we get to look upon that situation in Scripture and see that even in that, that hardest of situations, you were right there with your people. Your Holy Spirit uh, is with us now, and we thank you that in our hard situations, in our tough environments, and under persecution or social pressures, uh, whatever we might be going through, the, the pain of, of lost loved ones, or whatever it might be, Lord, we thank you that you are still, through your Holy Spirit, so willing to journey with us so willing to come and be in the fire with us, giving us strength and the power that we need. So Lord, tonight we want to call on that power. We want to ask for more of a filling from you, Lord, as we surrender. So that as we go out from this place and into an environment that can often be so uncomfortable, that doesn't agree with the things that, that we believe to be your truth. Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit and your filling in our lives would be the strength that we require to be a witness for an unfailing God that you are. And so we praise you, we worship you, and we lift your name on high. In Jesus' name. Jesus 
so worthy of all praise here I am here I am to worship and here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So
I'm a child of God. Yes, I was lost, but he brought me and know his love for me. Oh, his love for me, together. who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he did. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free in me. Oh, I'm a child.
so good to be praised, eh? Amen. Well, what a, what a privilege to know that if we're followers of Jesus Christ, we're seen as children of the King. It's awesome. Man, let's have our identity in Him. So His name's praised, amen? Amen. amen. The name above every name. Let's, let's worship. Yeah. And I praise in the valley And I praise on the mountain And I praise when I'm sure And I praise when I'm doubting Yeah And I praise when I'm numbered And I praise when surrounded Cause praise is the waters My enemies drowning Come on as long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. And I praise when I feel it, and I praise when I don't. Hey! And I praise because I know. You're still in control. My praise turns a weapon. It's more than a sound. It's more than a sound. My, My praise, praise is a shout hey. that brings Jericho down. Come on. Hey. As, as long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord. Oh. He has come. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. No, cause I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How can I keep it inside? Come on. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Come on, let's see those hands. Let's get clapped. Come on. Hey. I praise cause you're sovereign, I praise cause you reign, I praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, and I praise cause you're faithful, I praise cause you're true, I praise cause there's nobody greater than you, and I praise cause you're sovereign, I praise cause you reign, I praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, I praise cause you're true, I praise cause there's nobody greater than you, let's say, praise the Lord, oh my soul, come on, praise the Lord, oh my soul, come on, let's lift up praise, praise the Lord, oh my soul. No, no, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How can I keep it inside? No, no, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How can I Come on, let's lift up praise. Come on. Praise the Lord oh my
Come on, let's lift our praise to the King. Amen. So cool. And I praise because you're sovereign. I praise because you reign. I praise because you rose and defeated the grave. And I praise because you're faithful. I praise because you're true. I praise because there's nobody greater than you. And I praise because you're sovereign. I praise because you reign. I praise because you rose and defeated the grave. And I praise because you're faithful. I praise because you're true. I praise because there's nobody greater than you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Man, I just want us to sing those words. Do you realize what we're singing? Man, they are powerful words. Sometimes we get excited with songs that jump up and down and we forget to look at the words. We praise him because he's sovereign, because he's reigned, because he rose and defeated the grave. He's faithful, he's true, and there's nobody greater than him. Amen? Amen? And I praise because you're sovereign. I praise because you reign. I praise because you rose and defeated the grave. And I praise because you're faithful. I praise because you're true. And I praise because there's nobody great. Come on. Oh, and I praise because you're sovereign. I praise because you reign. And I praise because you rose and defeated the grave. And I praise because you're faithful. I praise because you're true. Come on. I praise because there's nobody greater than you. Let's say. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Let's lift up praise. Oh my soul, come on! Praise the Lord, oh my soul, come on and praise Jesus! No, 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 and I won't be quiet, my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? No, no, I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How could I keep it inside? No, no, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? We sing now. Praise. Yes, Lord. We praise the Lord. Yes, Jesus. My That's happens when you go off script. Never, no one ever knows what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Sam, wrap us up. <laughs> Thought you might bait me out seat, again. Seat, oh, how good, eh? How good. Come on, praise the Lord, amen. Come on, praise the Lord, amen. How good. Man, what a word. What an incredible word. Pastor Jake, thank you. That, that was amazing. I'm, I struggle sometimes to, to come up with, with things to talk about after, but that, that was just so rich, man. I, honestly, I encourage you all to go back and, and listen to that one again. We are not called to conform. We are called to follow. We do not need to bow down to society to earn our freedom. God has already given it to us. Two, be careful not to be caught living in the in-between. Don't put restrictions on God's unlimited provision. You do not belong in this world, so don't leave your foot in its camp because all that gives you is instability. Trust me, I've been there. I've tried it. All it gives is instability. Three, it is so much bigger than us, so much bigger. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over their bodies. The hairs on their heads were not singed, and their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire was on them. They had spent time in the fire. They had spent time in the world of sin, and they had come out of it unharmed. How crazy is that? That we can walk in that too. That we can be unharmed, you know, that it had no effect on them. And when they came out of that fire, everybody saw them untouched saved by a power greater than they could ever possibly imagine. Don't conform, don't compromise, hold fast. Can we give uh, Jake some honor for that, that message? Glory goes to God, but wow, I'm going home and listening to that again. That was good.
Um, I just want to reiterate um, at the end there, Jake was, was talking to a couple groups of people, and if you feel like he has spoken to you, or maybe there's some questions that it's raised, or even if you just want prayer, I really encourage you not to leave without coming down to the front or just talking to someone about it. You know, we want to we want to pray with you. We want to walk alongside you. You know, sometimes we the people up here on stage, we're not perfect. We need prayer too. You know, we're down here at the front too sometimes. So just just I really want to encourage you because that's where that's where God can really move. That's where the spirit really moves is when other Christians gather alongside one another in prayer and just speaking out truth over each other's lives. So come talk to Pastor Jake. He wants to talk to you. Uh, he is a lovely guy. Trust me, he's worthwhile having a conversation with. Who's laughing? What the heck? It's your lead pastor. No, but honestly, come down and have a chat. And if you don't want to do that, just have a chat to the people around you. Talk about what you've, what you've learned, what you've heard about, what you're thinking it through. Uh, on the way out, make sure that you grab the discussion guide for our series starting next week. The new people also grab the, uh, the starter kit. I don't know if it's called that, but I'm calling it that. Uh, uh, we also have a young adults hangout down at the Webb Street flat at uh, Jake, James's, and Shona's here too at their house. Uh, that's 16 Webb Street, and we'll be heading around there at 8.30. Okay, so head on around there. Um, if you're keen, grab some Maccas on the way if you're hungry, um, and then we'll have some good time just, just um, hanging out in fellowship. A reminder that the hike is this Saturday. Uh, trust me, it's okay if you don't feel like you're fit enough. It'll be okay. All right, I'm not fit either. I don't know if I'm going, but I'm not fit either. So if I'm there, trust me, I'll be, I'll be leading the, the pack because put the slowest at the front. That's all good. I'm looking through my notes. Yes, and also... Uh, if you're inter interested in the send, uh, you want to know a little bit more about it, Michael will be around for a few minutes after the service. Come have a chat to him. Uh, he's got some good information about it too, and he's just a good guy in general. So come have a chat to him about it um, or get registered on the website or our app. That's where also the hike registrations will be. Um, and, uh, yeah, if we don't catch up with you during the week, we pray that you have a blessed week. We'll see you back here next week. Same time, same place. God bless. Mm -hmm.